This is my essay on Vermeer's geographer, A Moment of Insight. It's at the Städelsches Kunstinstitut in Frankfurt. Sorry if you speak German, I'm butchering that. The article was originally published in 1999. This version is revised. A few words before we start about color reproductions. I have actually seen this painting and I know what it looks like. It does not, the wall behind him does not have the purplish cast that's in the right-hand picture, which is from Wikipedia. So even though the color of blue of his robe there is one of my favorite colors of blue, we're not using that picture. The center image is from the museum's website. You would think that that would mean it would be dead accurate, but very often images of paintings on museum websites the colors are just wrong. Uh, in this case, I have a giant catalog from the 1995 exhibition of Vermeer at the National Gallery in Washington, and print is static. You get the colors right, and they're there, unless the page browns or whatever, they stay right. So I have corrected the image from the museum's website to the image on the right which among other things lets you see the color and texture of the rug in the foreground. And I don't think that Vermeer would have put that much effort into it if he hadn't meant it to be visible. So we are using the image on the right. A few words of introduction. As a freelance art historian, my mission is constantly to seek out art that's inspiring, thought-provoking, skillfully executed, and or beautiful, so that I can share it in jargon-free language with others who need and enjoy such art, but don't have the time to search it out. Ayn Rand called art emotional fuel. My goal and my pleasure is to help others find such fuel and to use it more efficiently. One of the ways I do this is by detailed discussions of art that I like. I've known people who fear that thinking too much about an artwork will dampen their emotional reaction. To me, that seems like seeing an attractive person at a party and avoiding him or her just in case you don't get along. I've always found that getting to know a work of art or a person makes my emotional reaction stronger, not weaker. So I hope you enjoy getting to know the geographer as much as I did. All right, think of a moment of insight, a moment when you had an integration of such scope that it made you stop writing, stop speaking, stop moving, so you could concentrate on working through the implications of that thought. What would you give for a reminder of that moment when you were tired or had writer's block, or when you just needed to remember that one man improves and the whole of mankind progresses by such moments of insight? The literal subject of Vermeer's geographer is simply a man leaning over a piece of parchment. The globe, maps on the floor and wall, and the dividers in his hands, those doodahs that look like a compass, uh, they're for measuring distances, all those indicate his occupation. Yet the painting undeniably depicts a moment of insight. Wait, undeniably? Isn't everyone entitled to his own opinion, however bizarre, about a painting's meaning? Doesn't the interpretation of art depend either on your gut feelings or on the author authoritarian pronouncements of those who know? No. A work of art is an artist's statement about some aspect of man and his world. The painter selects objects he considers important and gives them a distinct color, illumination, texture, and arrangement. He gives them a certain emphasis, sets a certain mood. In so doing, he presents his judgment of those particular bits of reality. And if he's good, he can show much more than that. Art is, in Ayn Rand's words, a selective recreation of reality according to an artist's metaphysical valued judgments. You can learn what the artist is saying by use of your own mind, not your gut, not someone else's statements, if you study the details of a painting systematically and meticulously. 
In this video, I will demonstrate how to examine a painting systematically in order to arrive at an accurate statement of the painting's meaning, its theme. My observations are based on the method of analyzing paintings that I outlined in How to Analyze and Appreciate Paintings, which is on the screen. You can find it on Amazon. So let's see what Vermeer includes and emphasizes in order to convey not just intellectual activity, but one of those rare moments of insight. The first item to catch my eye is the man's face, and that's in part because the curves of his forehead and nose, which are highlighted in white, are set off sharply against the dark shadow on the armoire. Vermeer, who is exceptionally skilled at portraying details, has shown hardly any distinctive features on this man's face. No bone structure and little variation in skin tone. Even his hair is an undistinguished brown shoved behind his ears to keep it out of the way. The only facial feature that stands out is his eyes, which are narrowed in concentration, looking toward the light from the window. The absence of detail and the emphasis on the eyes indicate that this is not a portrait of a specific individual, but of a thinker. The man's hands, like his face, are brightly illuminated so that our eyes are also drawn to them. The left hand, resting on a book, bears the weight of his torso. Look at the straightness of the arm and the set of his shoulder. In his other hand, the dividers are poised sideways in midair rather than touching the parchment on the table. It's a fleeting pose. It's slightly off balance, as if he has stopped to think for a moment and will soon turn back to the parchment to continue his work. In another context, the slightly bent posture might signal fatigue or old age. But here, combined with the angle of the head, it's quite clearly, it quite clearly indicates an abrupt pause while the man weighs a new idea. Close inspection of the painting has revealed that the geographer's head was originally inclined toward the parchment and the dividers were held vertically, ready to be used. Think of the difference this would have made. We would see a man hard at work rather than at a moment of insight. All right, now look at the geographer's robe. It's plain, it's simple, it's unobtrusive. What, did it, what does it tell us? First of all, that he's motionless because it's falling in straight, simple lines. It also tells us that he's not overly concerned with his physical appearance because this is functional clothing, not the elaborate apparel that's often depicted in paintings of this period. But despite its simplicity, the robe has an important visual function. The V shape of the red edging and the white shirt tucked beneath it both help draw attention to the, uh, to the geographer's face. If you cover the red and white, as I did in the version on the right, some of the emphasis on his face is lost. What about the setting? The chamber in which we see the geographer is quite clearly his room, his work area. Every item in it is for his use, on his scale, within his reach. He's the center of and the purpose for that room. The objects surrounding him are rigorously selected either to tell us more about the man's actions or to add to the mood. The dividers show that he's not merely looking at the maps that are scattered around him, but taking measurements for some purpose of his own. The globe, the books on top of the armoire, the map on the wall, the parchment on the floor, are condensations of other men's knowledge, which our geographer is using in his own inquiries. With the exception of the globe, which catches light from the window and helps move the eye around the painting, the other props, the books, the armoire, the window panes, the framed map, the chair, the small table in the foreground are all strictly rectangular and painstakingly proportioned and positioned in relation to each other and to the geographer. They provide an unadorned, almost mathematical setting for the geographer's work. Imagine for a moment that the window had richly textured looped curtains or that the armoire was elaborately carved, the chair overstuffed, or the map frame elaborately gilt. 
the emphasis would shift away from the geographer and what he's doing. Also notice the importance of the window. By its presence and by the fact that the man is looking toward it, it marks him as someone who's in touch with the outside world, with reality, not an ivory tower philosopher. Again, imagine the difference if the man had his back to the window or if he were in his study late at night with only candlelight for illumination. But even here, Vermeer has included the bare minimum. We can see the clear, bright light flooding in the window, but we cannot see out the window. There is no cityscape or landscape to distract our attention. Despite the pared down furnishings, Vermeer's meticulous depiction of how the light hits different surfaces in the room makes the geographer study a place so full of rich textures and colors that it almost seems luxurious. Look at the shine on the windowsill and the globe and the creamy smoothness of the parchment spread out in front of the geographer. Look at the heavy matte blue fabric of his robe and the crisp white of the shirt beneath. Look at the unobtrusive but intricate tapestry that covers that small stiff chair over at the right. Look at the rug in the foreground. At this period, it was common to use a rug for a tablecloth. Notice how the red and the blue of the geographer's robe are echoed in its complex pattern and how its lush folds have been thrust aside so that he can work. Observe how even the plaster wall and the bare floor are made decorative by the play of light and shadow from creamy white to, to deep brown. These background colors are important. They help set a warm, bright atmosphere. If the dominant colors were chilly shades of blue or purple, and the light were pure white rather than yellowish, the room would appear bleak and austere. It is fascinating to compare the geographer with Veer's astronomer, which was probably painted as a pendant to the geographer. In the astronomer, we see a man with hair and robe very similar to the geographer's. He too faces a brightly lit window, but instead of gazing out of it, he intently studies a globe. And instead of standing frozen in mid motion, he's seated with his hand resting on the globe. The sunlight here seems less bright, and the colors certainly are. The astronomer's robe is a deep greenish blue, and the rug is in subdued blue and green tones. Like the geographer, the astronomer is engaged in rigorous intellectual activity, but we see him still gathering information. The geographer, on the other hand, has gathered his information and has just had the moment of insight when his observations are integrated into a new level of knowledge. And if there had been more of the world, they would have reached it, said Camões, with splendid arrogance of the 15th century Portuguese explorers. Vermeer shows us that heroes are not only those who sail uncharted seas, but those who painstakingly integrate the sailor's findings. Here, in a visual image that we can grasp in an instant, is a man discovering a new fact about reality in a world wide open to his inquiring mind. All right. I said earlier that the geographer is about a moment of insight. Is disagreement on this point possible? Yes, but it must be based on a precise observation of the elements of the painting. It's justifiable to say, for example, I disagree with your interpretation based on X, which you failed to mention, and Y, which you misinterpreted. It's not justifiable to say, I don't know why I just feel you're wrong. What about your emotional reaction to a work of art? For many of us, such a reaction is the only reason we spend more than a minute gazing at a painting. Few things are as satisfying and exciting as seeing a painting that sums up your values, your view of the world. But your emotional reaction is in fact a combination of what the painting says with your own memories, thoughts, and experiences. If your father was a geographer, you might love Vermeer's geographer simply because of that. If the room in the geographer reminds you of the principal's office in your high school, on the other hand, you may take an immediate dislike to this painting. But the painting's theme remains the same, independent of your emotional reaction, be it positive or negative. 
Discussing your emotional reaction is not the same as discussing the objective meaning of the painting. To end the reign of abstract art and make representational art dominant again, we need more than artists who are highly skilled at representational art, important as that is. We also need viewers who know what art is and is not, and who can interpret and evaluate art without relying on the pronouncements of art critics. In short, we need not only skilled producers, but educated consumers. If you're interested in how to analyze paintings, paintings and sculpture, I've given you the titles of my two Kindle books there uh, to join the Sunday recommendations list, which gets you three art related recommendations every week. See the URL there or email me. You can support me starting at $5 a month or follow me for free on Patreon for more videos. And check out dianedurantywriter.com for hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, music, poetry, Central Park, and my other obsessions. Thank you again for listening.